Bell. Current. Present. Here. 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 Wherefore. Here. Arboro. Present. Elliot. Here. Okay. All present. Yes. Anybody have anything they'd like to share in two minutes or less? Apparently not. All right. I will. Pardon me? I'll speak. I didn't know if you were going to share a statement beforehand. Um, you'll need to tell us your name and where you're from. Okay. I am Cindy Belcher. I'm from Lakeshore Schools. Sorry. Can we come over there? Yeah. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Cindy Belcher. I am um, become all of a sudden local or vocal, I guess, for a lot of parents. And we're just advocating for freedom of parents to choose as far as back to school plans. And if they mask or if they vaccinate, they can or they can't. But just to advocate for the parents to be able to choose for that. Um, there's a lot that I would love to say. I don't really like the two minute limit. But I understand. So just to share a couple of personal experiences, one teacher said, as a teacher and a parent of two graduates, I'm begging parents to get involved on behalf of our kids. Teaching last year was so unbelievably depressing. I love to smile and tell kids good morning, passing kids that I don't even know in the halls in the morning, and that just stopped. No one even bothered looking at each other let alone say anything. It was the most cold and unfriendly environment I've ever taught in. What's upsetting me most is the damage that we're doing mentally and emotionally to our kids. The masking and the separation must end. Another parent said, as parents and grandparents, we have to stand up for our kids and stop this insanity. My 13-year-old granddaughter, who rarely complains, told me yesterday that she feels really weird about school. She'll be in eighth grade and should be excited about her last year in junior high. She said, I usually feel excited about going back to school and seeing my friends, but I just hope we don't have to wear masks, especially in gym class. I hope we can use lockers and not have to carry our coats and books all day. I hope we can sit with our friends for lunch. I hope we can have regular lunch and use the microwave. For God's sake, let me be kids. Let them be kids. There will always be viruses. And I've got um, a couple people in our group that are parents and their teachers and their local health care workers. And they're saying if they're forced to wear a mask, they're not going to teach this year. If they're forced to get a vaccination, they're not going to teach this year. They're going to quit. People feel very strongly that they need to be able to choose. Don't force the mandate. Let the parents choose. That's all we're advocating for is let the parents choose. So um, my three oldest kids have gone to summer camp all summer. They've been piggybacking, holding hands, sitting really close. Like you guys, you guys are all sitting really close. And there's been no issues at all. This entire summer camp, hundreds of kids together. You go downtown, you see tons of people close to each other. You see the beach. It's packed with people. So I really don't want to see a bunch of mandates in the fall based on life looks really normal right now and, and we're doing fine. So thank you for your time. Okay, I have um, I it's informal for me because I I wasn't preparing anything, but I'll do my best. Okay. I'm Vedette Palos Cordes. I had a daughter who just graduated from uh, St. Joe High School just this past year. Thank goodness. Um, 
from right here in St. Joe, Michigan. Um, I, I farm in sodas, family farm, but I live here in St. Joe. And then I have a son who's attending Lake Michigan Catholic. He will be in seventh grade this year. So um, just to reiterate what you are, what you have just expressed, same thing with me. Last year was very difficult. It was very difficult, especially for my daughter, whom prior to this whole scenario, she was excited about graduating this year. She was excited about going to college. We actually had trips planned to look at several different four-year universities. My daughter is a very bright young lady. She graduated with honors. Since the, uh, this shutdown, she is no longer interested in college. She is, um, we coaxed her to finally agree to maybe take some classes at Lake Michigan College. But my daughter is also very bright. She actually foreseen what was possibly going down in the future more so than me. I said, I don't understand why you all of a sudden decided not to be motivated anymore. And she said, because this is never going to end. She said, I don't want to get the vaccination. I don't want to be forced to get the vaccination. I don't want to wear a mask. If she goes to a university, she's going to be forced to do something against her will and against her beliefs. And I applaud my 18-year-old girl who is far smarter and brighter than most adults. And that she actually said this prior to graduating. I, I applaud her for her brightness. And I applaud her for her strength. That gives me hope as a young lady for our future to fight for our freedoms. I applaud her for that. And now going to my son. So she's gonna be going to LMC College. Now to my son who is 12. He said to me last fall, mom, I have anxiety, I'm not happy. I had to watch my son play basketball, wearing a mask and throwing up on the sidelines just so he could play basketball. As a mother, that irate me, and it, I, it, it brought out the mama bear in me, okay? Now, two days ago, my son, who will be attending seventh grade, had just informed me he does not want to go to school. He does not want to go to school because he cannot deal with the mask. And this is a, and, and some people know me personally in here and some people don't, but my son is a nature of force, or force of nature, excuse me, um, full of energy, gregarious, loves to talk in there. And for my son to mentally flip like that gives me great concern. Ma'am, I need you to wrap up. Yeah. So anyway, so anyway, I just want to point to the mental implications that are being placed on these children. And thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Again, we'd like to have this is an agenda item in terms of a presentation. It's an opportunity to make a brief public comment. If anyone wishes to do that, keep mindful of two minutes limit. Please step forward. If not, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the matters you're referring to are not within our control. Um, many times in the months past, we wish they were, but they're not. Uh, these are decisions made from on high. Uh, Washington advancing. Michigan has an unusual statutory arrangement. I didn't want to say scheme, but the scheme could have a bad connotation. Um, but as Courtney Davis, our acting uh, PHO, public health officer, can tell you, the state has a lot of control over every county's public health operation. That's not normally the way it works. Uh, the only linkage I can think of that's anywhere close is the Attorney General has concurrent jurisdiction with a county prosecutor. So if a prosecutor declined to prosecute a case, the AG could say, well, I'm going to, because the AG has jurisdiction concurrent in every county with every elected county prosecutor. We appoint a public health officer, but 
that appointment isn't official until the state director approves it. We had to have the director approve the interim appointment, the six month appointment, after Nikki Britton left to take a job in the private sector. So um, they're involved locally. They have a long reach and they can issue directives which our health department must follow, whether we agree or disagree. Um, I can tell you we've had a Board of Health for a long time, probably pushing 60 years, created back when this was a 49-member Board of Supervisors. Imagine um, being in the Kansas City stockyard, that's what it was like, 40 or 47. <laughs> A lot of people got together and not much got done. So uh, we've had the Board of Health. It's been a, a good thing to have. They serve an advisory role, but we um, try not to, to uh, do anything that would disrespect these folks for donating their time to help the community. If they don't have the authority to tell the schools what to do, nor do we. Those directions come out of land center primarily. I doubt there's anyone at this table who would say, we want to have kids wearing masks all day at school. I certainly don't. Um, our kids are grown, but if they were in school, I would have a vital interest in not having them wearing those masks because kids aren't really the ones who are transmitting anything. Um, but they're resilient, uh, but those decisions aren't for us to make. Uh, and what we do provide is guidance. Uh, and we've done that for years. We do that every year during the flu season. You'll see the health department issue guidance for the schools and the general public. You'll see something coming out in the next couple of months about making sure you're well protected from mosquitoes. If you're out in the yard, especially. Nice. Yeah. Well, that too. Nice as a big one. I mean, where I am, we've got uh, some marshland, and I wear a net, a hat with a net on it to try to avoid uh, getting uh, equine encephalitis. Uh, so our department's involved in lots of these things for the public health. But uh, just bear in mind, we, um, unless we declare a state of emergency, there's really not a whole lot we can do uh, in terms of the state other than trying to persuade folks in Lansing to make decisions that are truly data driven. Thank you. Yeah. If that sparked any interest in making a public comment, you still have time, otherwise, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Who do we contact that to, to help us uh, get our voices heard?
same way, we're going to go to Dr. Joyce Jong, and then we're going to go to Courtney Davis. Good morning. So I am uh, Dr. Joyce Young. I'm your medical examiner. There are some familiar faces around the table, but maybe not uh, all of them. And so I always like to start this presentation uh, a little bit by uh, making sure that everybody understands, uh, gets a bigger picture on what the medical examiner's office does. A lot of times they jump, we sort of jump right to the uh, the, uh, well, that's the autopsy piece, and that is a part of what we do. But for every death that is reported to our office, and thankfully not every death is reported to our office, but for every death that is reported, we, uh, we number one, determine if it's within our jurisdiction. And if it is, we then send an investigator. So although we're based at the medical school in Kalamazoo, we have uh, investigators who, are, who live in this county and work in this county, and they respond to the scene. And they, uh, they do an investigation of that death scene uh, and uh, determine if it's something that would need to have a postmortem exam. There's, there's a, there are six forensic pathologists right now. We, we actually are losing two, so we're recruiting back two more. Uh, but, um, but we have six forensic pathologists. One of us is always on call, and they take a call from that investigator. If it's a really obvious situation that clearly is, uh, meets the criteria for needing a postmortem exam, they, they, they handle uh, arranging for transport. We use the local funeral homes to do that. Uh, but then uh, before they can release anybody directly to a funeral home, they'll contact the on-call medical examiner and uh, have a discussion about that about that that death. So that that's uh, so we have both the uh, you know for all these deaths being reported, we are responsible to investigate all of them. We are responsible for doing the postmortem exams. We also evaluate and review every every cremation permit that that occurs. Uh, that that is requested before someone is cremated. We have to look at the. We at least do a. We look at the death certificate and look to see if it's anything that maybe should have more of an investigation if it hasn't had one um, already. Uh, I am the medical examiner for 13 counties. This report lists 12, but that's because we just picked up Cass County, and so uh, we don't have them in our annual report yet. So uh, it's a we're a, a a big office, a robust office with a lot going on there. Um, and uh, I, in, I think you did receive a digital copy of this report as well. And uh, oftentimes there's questions about like, you know, well, what's happening in, in a, another county that's maybe similar in size, similar in population. And you want to compare what, what's going on in your county with other counties. So I used to make individual reports for each county, but now we just put them all together because that way it gives you the opportunity to quickly refer to that. So 2020 was uh, obviously it was an, an interesting year. Uh, and uh, uh, where'd we go here? Oh, here's the, here's a mouse. So let me show you on, uh, on Berrien County. In all of our counties, uh, we had an increase in the number of deaths. And although we only have two years of data here because I've only had two full years as the medical examiner for Berrien County, uh, there, there was a 15% increase between 19 and 20. And, and I think if you look through some of the other counties that, where I've been the medical examiner for more years, those numbers stay pretty stable. There's a little bit of variation, but but uh, across all counties, we did see a significant increase in the number of deaths. So in this case, it was now like I said, and those are all deaths that occurred in the county. If somebody to us uh, increased by even more. all these numbers was 
was a, a real a real significant increase in the number of natural deaths that occurred. We went from 321 to 470, which is a 46 percent increase uh, in in natural deaths. We also saw an increase in accidents by 23 percent. We'll look at that a little more uh, with a little more detail. Suicide stayed the same, homicide stayed the same, and an indeterminate death is just where we don't have enough information. Uh, we have all the information available, but we don't have enough information to decide was it a suicide or an accident, for example. So uh, that, that's kind of um, where we are. I think the biggest surge also in deaths that were being reported were uh, it, it were of adults, um, although it did go up a little bit for the 11 to 17 year olds. Looking here, let's see, uh, I guess I can't really quite see the top, but these are, the, the very top there are accidental deaths, so deaths that are classified as an accident. And as a medical examiner, we are, by, by law, we have to classify every death, whether into whether it's, a, if it's reported to us, we have to put on the death certificate, was it a natural, an accident, suicide, homicide, or indeterminate? And so we saw the biggest increase really in, uh, in accidental deaths, and where that really comes into play are, um, what were drug-related fatalities, where it went from 23 to 37. So a 61% increase in drug-related fatalities of accidental drug overdoses. And you could see that elsewhere too. Suicides actually from, um, if, if it was drug-related, uh, we had a drop there. That was just that just shows the, the mechanism of uh, drug-related deaths in, in that area. So that was really the, the biggest increase that you saw we, um, I, I think what is, what, uh, there's another report, which I don't have, uh, I, I don't think it's on here, but you do have it electronically, and that's this, it's the, uh, it's an annual report purely of the drug uh, deaths related to opioids and other drugs. The state of Michigan has a real strong increase in this. Well, the countrywide, there's a, a real strong interest in this, and the, uh, the CDC actually funds a program through the state of Michigan that uh, allows uh, us to have, you know, they, 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 we, we provide them with information and they take a really close look at that to figure out what drugs are actually causing the death. Most of them have an opioid in them. And when I say that, it's these are typically not prescription drugs. These are illicitly produced opioids. And, uh, but, but it also uh, gives a lot of information. How many minor children were left behind? What other what other factors were going on? How many of them had recently been released from jail or prison? And did they have a history of substance abuse? Did they have chronic pain? Uh, so there's just a lot of a lot more information in there uh, that that that's that's of value. So I, I think um, you know it, it actually for us is a was a, a, a an extremely busy year, uh, 2020. Things have not slowed down for us, uh, and I'm you know I don't have. 2021 data yet to really understand why, but our office is uh, busier than ever. Yes. I would like to ask, what are those small numbers? If you go back a slide, you bet. But what, what are those small numbers by the in the 2020? By the tw oh, so when there's like a a little like um like if there's like the under drowning, there's nine with the with the footnote. Oh, look yeah. down here. Yeah. yeah, right. So, yep, those are oh. footnotes. So sometimes, you know, kind of like, like if because if you add things up, sometimes things don't make sense. So we add a little footnote for one. So one of those was a drowning death, but it was also somebody who had had a mixed drug intoxication. They had taken a number of drugs and then they were in the bathtub and they slipped down. So they they drowned, but they probably wouldn't have drowned if it hadn't been for the drug. So you kind of they end up getting counted twice. So so it, it, that's one example of that. And so it's kind of a um, uh, it, it, it's just a little more information on that Thank particular you. death. You're, you're welcome. So, and, and uh, I don't know if I can, let me see once here if I can try something. There's control home. There we go. Um, and if we, you'll be able to look through all of these, but let's see here. Comparison of all ME counties there. I think I could click on that. This will be, this is kind of the place where you might want to look and see once, you know, how did you compare it to say, you know, um, Calhoun, Kalamazoo, you know, our sort of our four larger counties are, are includes Berrien, Calhoun, uh, Kalamazoo, and, uh, and Muskegon. And those are kind of, I think, of those counties, they're all sort of experiencing the same thing. 
big surges in drug-related fatalities and a large number of deaths overall. Like I said, not, uh, not all deaths are reported to us. We saw a big increase in the number of deaths from, 20 to tw uh, from, from, from 2019 to 2020. There was clearly uh, an increase in, in the number of deaths that was occurring. And uh, I don't know, uh, I, d I don't have the data to be able to say, well, this many were COVID and this many were, were whatever. I mean, I, they were not all COVID. I mean, it, this is completely anecdotal, but my brother, for example, he, um, I, I got wind from one of my other siblings, he was having trouble breathing. And I called him and I said, you're having trouble breathing. You know, why, why aren't you going to the hospital? He says, well, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Cause I, I went and I got a COVID test and it was negative. So I'm all right. And I said, yeah, yeah, but you're having trouble breathing. He said, yeah, I know. And he ended up, you know, I said, well, go to the hospital because there's a whole lot of other things that can give you trouble breathing. You know, And so he went to the hospital and was immediately you know, put in the intensive care unit. He was in congestive heart failure, had never had it before and was being evaluated for a heart transplant. But I think, you know, sometimes, you know, it wouldn't have been a COVID death. But if somebody was not going in because they got their COVID test or whatever that was, there, that may have been, they may have accounted for some of the increased mortality, uh, but um, so I, I don't know precisely why, and that'll take more time to try and sort that out. But that's uh, that's sort of where we are right now. Are there questions? Doctor, with the Bina Border County for deaths that occur at a South End or Elkhart Hospital, how are those captured as? Are they, how, how are they reflected in your data? They wouldn't be. So, so yeah, and, and I think that the, the county clerk actually publishes it, the clerk here. Um, there. Right, oh, okay. <laughs> in fact, I think they actually publish uh, the, the number of deaths of residents. So if somebody is a resident of the county, uh, that, that information actually is more readily available uh, because that's tracked, but because those aren't reported to us, we just kind of, we look at like what's happening just within the county, so. I think the death certificate would actually be issued by the Elkhart County Coroner and the St. Joe County Coroner, even if it was a very county resident. Right, or even just by the hospital physician if they died in the hospital there. Okay. Can I, and the same lines, is it the same way? So someone from Illinois that's visiting passes away here. They're on this report. They're on this report, yep. I think most of them are actually residents, uh, but but there is some of that, that kind of. They want you to think so for property tax purposes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. Any other questions? I mispronounced your name. That's all right. Young? It's the young. Okay. Um, your work and the other MEs are doing work out of the medical school in Western and Kalamazoo. We are, yes. We're on the top floor. If you, uh, I always offer this to county commissioners, and a lot of times I, uh, I'm taken up on this. But if you ever would like a tour of the facility to see where the residents are being cared for, we welcome that. We can make arrangements for that. I had one commissioner come from Van Buren County and afterwards he announced at a commissioner's meeting that he's no longer afraid to die. Now, I don't know that I can impart that kind of comfort to you, but <laughs> but he said, he, he said, just knowing, you know, and it, it's probably good. It's actually, it's a, a really, um, it's an amazing, beautiful facility, uh, even, and we're on the top floor, and we have the, the entire floor, and, uh, you know, I think sometimes you're just comforted to know that it's, uh, it, it's a good place where, you're, where your residents are going. It's uh, the entire facility and all of our big equipment purchases all come from donor money, um, which is beneficial to the entire, all of the counties that we serve then, so... Um, it's it's a valuable uh, event, and we're we're pretty fussy there about making sure people are well cared for. Uh, we might mock each other, but we're never making disparaging comments about families or anybody else. It's just not tolerated. So, so uh, if you ever want that that visit, feel free to contact me. The other thing I always like to wrap up with commissioners and say, if you ever have somebody who contacts you and they're having a problem, they're having a problem getting a death certificate or whatever that is. Uh, please reach out to us because we're, we're very focused on customer service. I think like a lot of places we're, um, we're, we're, we're busy and we're strapped for help uh, somewhat, but, uh, but we, we're 
doing our best. And there, if there's a problem that pops up, we'll certainly address that. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Hey, just a quick comment. I just want to thank Dr. Young and her staff and the local medics and medical examiners. You know, this is kind of a new partnership in the country. A couple of years, it's worked very well uh, for our agency and law enforcement across the country. So, thank you. Good. Good to hear that. Can the public ask a question? Not right now. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks. Thank I just wanted to echo Chuck's statements. Um, Dr. Douglas, in particular, I had interactions with. Okay. Uh, your staff is more than professional. Okay. Oh, they're incredibly helpful. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks again. All right. Thank, thank you. Good morning. 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 Yep. And then do you want to take it from there? Or do you? Oh, this, I can take it. should still be able to run that. Okay, good deal. All right, thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you for letting me come and share this morning. I'm going to see if I can. I don't know if that made it any bigger for Okay, there we go. There's some graphs in there that might help to have it just a little bit larger. Um, I believe they were emailed out as well, but we can definitely share them after. I know sometimes it's hard to see them. Um, but thank you for letting me come and just provide a, a brief update this morning. I will try to keep it brief. I'm sure there are questions too. But I just wanted to review some of our data, um, have been working to really do some deeper analysis and be able to bring some of that to you. Some of it looks at our period of the summer while others is kind of the course of our pandemic period, really focus in on what are our current priorities with our COVID-19 response and just talk a little bit about specifically around supporting our education partners, our school systems, and what we're, we're preparing for for fall. So just to kind of set our scene this morning, um, and this is something you may have, have read in the Herald Palladium, um, our board chair, Peg Coring, was able to reiterate and read a response yesterday at our board meeting. But our ongoing response goals really are to decrease transmission of COVID-19 in Berrien County and to continue to protect our most vulnerable residents from illness and death. This has been our goal the whole time. So this has been a transcending goal. We also want to ensure that we protect the capacity of our local health system to ensure that they can safely provide health care for all residents in need. Um, to Dr. DeYoung's point, we had many residents who were hesitant to go in for care. We want to make sure that as our COVID numbers could increase or when they were increased, that that impact on our health system did not limit our ability to provide care for other, other health needs. And then to support and promote the overall physical, mental, and emotional health of community members and pandemic response partners. I know we often really fall into looking at health, and health is really inclusive of all of those things, not just the physical body. So really being able to have that lens as we look at our data and make our decisions and recommendations as a public health department. One thing that you will really know, and Peg was able to articulate this yesterday, especially as we get into working with some of our partners. Um, the health department, we, we don't have regulatory authority over some of those partners like our school systems. What our role is, and um, Commissioner Elliott was able to also say, is providing recommendations and guidance. This is something that public health does for many different reasons and really being able to convene and work with partners, share data, show the assessment and monitoring and decision-making that we're working through to have those recommendations and guidance really be fulfilled in our community. So first, I'm just gonna start going through some of the data with you all. Um, this first graph that you're seeing, you've probably seen a number of other times. This is um, how we have been for the course of the pandemic looking at our, our COVID cases. So this is a seven, seven day rolling average of confirmed cases. So that means someone who was tested and tested positive. The, the larger graph is a little bit of a deeper snapshot. So this is looking from March through present. And you'll kind of see how we have come down this summer. I think a big piece of that you can kind of see in April is, of course, vaccination has increased. So we've been able to keep those numbers lower. 
that top inset graph, that is of the entire pandemic period, so that the last 16 months. And you'll just notice there some of our highest times um, were last November with that 167. Um, and right now, really in that, that lower period, right now we're seeing roughly eight cases a day. So this graph um, is able to look a little bit uh, deeper. It's a compound graph where you're looking at the distribution um, of age by positive cases. So you're looking at a couple different things here. Um, the red line that you kind of see going through with the, the dots on it, those are our actual cases. And then the colors are telling you the percentage at any given time by age group. So for example, right now our numbers have been really small. We're down kind of here at the end here in July. So that's a little bit harder to look, but if you're looking at this, um, I guess my right, you're right as well if you're looking at the screen column, roughly 7%, if you look at that, would fall into the zero to 11. Our biggest area, kind of that orange 20 to 29 of our current cases, that works out to about 23%. So you're kind of using those percentages and that's of our total cases. Right now, being in that eight day average with those low numbers, you kind of use those percentages are pretty small because you're talking maybe one person or two people who fall into those different categories. So we are continuing to look um, at our confirmed cases um, and then also our, our death statistics. It's really important for us that we're not just looking at our current cases. Again, back to that goal of being able to ensure that we're not overwhelming our health system means that we're protecting our most vulnerable, right? We're not seeing severe illness. We're not seeing those deaths. So this is really showing us the total deaths and percent positivity um, and how that aligns together. You would expect kind of a correlation where deaths always lag a little bit when you have those high percent positivities, your deaths usually lag a few weeks after that. That's that incubation period of the virus. Um, so you see in November, we had kind of our largest peak a few weeks later, you did see our deaths increase. I will note that you don't see this happening in March to April. One thing that we can really look at that is this is when our most vulnerable, our 65 plus, more of our health care workers, our adult foster care, they were all able to have vaccination. So when we had that peak in March, we didn't see that two week lag. So that is a really good number for us to look at. Again, this is just by age, kind of showing that distribution. I know that we have shared that data before, but really um, we're, we're continuing to see and have seen those deaths in our older population. And this is overall, so this is the course of the whole pandemic. All right, with our hospital partners, we're also able to really look at Spectrum Health Lakeland data. And this is really what helps us ensure that we are meeting that goal of not overwhelming our healthcare system, also just not seeing severe illness. So you'll kind of see over the course, as we had a peak in cases, our hospitalizations have also increased. Here this summer, um, as could be expected, we're seeing success of the vaccines. Uh, we we maybe had a slight increase. So early in July, we were only seeing maybe two, three people at a time in the hospital. Now we are seeing a closer to eight to 10, but we're still in those single digits. And that is a really good thing. We're not seeing people as much in the ICU so that really severe illness is not being observed in our general population. All right. Oh, and you know what? Okay, I am gonna skip ahead and come back to this. I think in the PowerPoint, I switched it. Okay, I wanna talk about this slide first because then that graph will make more sense. So um, this, this is a set of new indicators that the CDC has developed this um, summer, kind of late spring, uh, with a lot of school guidance and things coming out of the CDC in the state of Michigan. You'll probably have started to see the low, the moderate, substantial, and high transmission. But these are, these are metrics that basically are measuring transmission in our community. So the first metric that we're looking at is total new cases per 100,000 persons. 
This is a cumulative. So looking at our cumulative cases over seven days. And then the second we're a bit more familiar with, this is our percent positivity. So our percent of positive um, COVID-19 tests over all of those that have been tested. In these areas, depending on where we fall is where we are getting those transmission things. These are where you're hearing out of the CDC that we're in low, moderate, substantial. Berrien County is in the moderate right now. Um, basically, basically how this works and, and that transpose that October should be a 10, apologies for that. Um, we, when you look at this, if you are in yellow and blue, you are always in the higher of the two. So when you're hearing out of the health department, what transmission stage that we are in, that is how we are going back and forth between this work. So this, sorry for the back and forth. This graph is, this is a graphical representation of this over the course of the whole pandemic. So you have two things happening in this graph. Um, they aren't necessarily meant to, to perfectly relate. The important part here is to really be looking at um, your, your peaks and your valleys and what you're seeing there. The blue is your cumulative, so our cases. And then the orange line, that is your percent positivity. So this is able to give us a historic look. What were we seeing last year this time? What were we seeing through the fall? Something that can help us kind of project into the future. Um, some of those aspects we know have changed. We have vaccination as part of our, our new game plan. We also have variants that we have to watch. But being able to look at these together, understand where we're at, we have been sitting really good in that moderate. This is where we have been seeing and looking at trends here. So I'll dig into that a little bit deeper when we when we get into the, the school data. All right, and this is those residents getting into vaccination who have received one or more dose and we're looking at 16 and over. The blue lines that you're seeing, that helps us just look on any given day um, how many vaccines were given and what our percentage increase was back in March, April, when we were giving thousands of vaccines a day and in a week, we were able to see that percentage. So when we're saying 50% of our community has been vaccinated, we've been able to see that percentage increase a little bit more. Now we're working a lot harder for those 0.5 and 5 percentage point increases. And a lot of this data, I will just preface, you will see a lot of it, this is 16 plus, a lot of the early tracking mechanisms were set up based on Pfizer being eligible for 16 plus. We are working on getting those down more so that you can see the whole scope of the 12 plus. All right, so that's just a high level of the data that we are really looking at to be successful and be able to support our, our decision making at the department. These are kind of our pillar areas of focus um, at the health department in, in our COVID response. The first two, um, COVID-19 vaccination and then case investigation and contact tracing, which is where we have our school support fall under. I'm gonna dig a little bit more into those in upcoming slides. So the others that we still though are really focused on is our, our customer service. So that is our communication guidance and recommendations matter, but they only matter as much as we can give really good, clear communication to our public. We can be sharing out this data, sharing out key messages, really working um, to ensure that facts are distilled out into our community. We still get a lot of questions into the department, so manning a hotline, being able to answer those questions in a timely manner. Um, poor response planning. So this is really about being that convener role in public health. Sometimes this is us sitting on state work groups. At the Berrien County Health Department, we have felt that it has been really important to have staff representation on as many of the state work groups as we can. That gives us an opportunity to try to share our local perspective, share our local context, influence where we can. Um, sometimes we have seen that as a success and sometimes it's an area we can continue to have that voice. Um, we also do that locally and regionally. We work with our, our vaccine and testing partners, so Spectrum Health Lakeland, our federally qualified health centers, that's InterCare and the Niles Family Health Clinic. 
it's really important that as we continue this response, that we are aligned with our partners, that we're saying the same messages, and that we're really wrapping around and protecting our community. We also still, our goal is our vulnerable population at the department. We still have a rapid response team. We can go out to long-term care facilities, adult foster care, and assisted living. We are seeing, gratefully, a lot less cases in those settings because of the high vaccination rates there. But whenever we do have that inclination, we see that there might be a problem. We're able to jump in really early, have good relationships with those facilities to be successful, and then promoting testing there. Um, we have really, really good testing partners in the county, which is great for the general public. We still do help with some of that kind of crisis intervention testing at some of our congregate care fa facilities. And then a big one for the summer has been continuity of operations. I'm sure you've heard this from businesses. This is no different in local government. We really want to sustain the, the traditional important public health services that we have. Our environmental health team out doing well, septic, restaurants, on the beaches, making sure that there are other public health duties and essential and critical functions are being performed for our community, making sure our clinical operations are robust, being able to add evening hours. That's one thing we've done this summer, working to get normal immunizations for childhood IMS caught up, hearing and vision, all of those things that over the last year really were disrupted. We don't want to have other problems surface because we were so hyper-focused on one, right? Making sure that we're having that wraparound approach. I know, just one second. Yes, absolutely. Committee um, secretaries have been advised we're running late, and your visitors are being advised to sit back. Okay. So the two areas I'm going to dive into are these first. So COVID vaccine, and then we'll talk a little bit about school guidance and some of those recommendations that are out there. Um, I do believe that they were handed out, but I will also send it electronically. You all do have the latest guidance that was um, issued from the local health department to in front of you. So if we first look at vaccination, so if we look at our vaccination rates um, in the county, if we look at 12 plus, we'll probably start only doing the 12 plus. I did leave the 16 just for this, but we're really close, right? We're about at that 54, almost tipping to that 55%. Um, we, of course, want to see that increase, so we'll continue to do that. Our 65 and older, though, 84%, that is a really good number. That means our most vulnerable in the county are protected. Going back to those data, that is why you're seeing some of those changes. When we had high percent positivity, then we had high deaths. Now we're not seeing that same thing. So this first graph here, um, and I'll, I'll show it a little bit bigger. We're able to actually begin to look at our vaccination rates by zip code and by census tract. What that allows us to do is dig a little bit deeper into what areas we need to continue to do outreach potentially identify if there's a need for a closer vaccination site. Um, what are those other underlying barriers to uh, receiving vaccination? This allows us to do that. When you're looking at these maps, the more green means the higher the vaccine rate, the, the lighter pink to kind of that, that fuchsia, that is lower vaccination rates in the county. So if we look at that here, this is just an example. You're not meant to see the numbers. We can, we can definitely share those. But this is just a representation. We can look at that census tract level. We can also overlay that with the social vulnerability index. So really understanding where we have low vaccine rates and where we might be having other um, impacting issues, whether it be transportation access, um, misinformation, whatever that might be, that we can dig in and understand that a little bit more. So again, this is for our 16 plus. This is a tool that the state has called My Lighthouse that has not yet been updated to 12 plus. So it is all at 16 plus. When we look at this, this is the one all in green pretty much. This is our 65 plus. Um, some of the areas that are lighter, one thing to note when we're looking at census tract, Sometimes there's also the law of small numbers. It might not actually look as low as the colors are, but when one more person is vaccinated, you get that higher percentage, right? So that, that sometimes is an impact too when you're looking at our 65 plus because we know as a county, we're about 84%. All right, so that is where we are at with vaccination. Um, 
want to talk a little bit about our case investigation and contact tracing and our school guidance. So one of the roles um, of local public health is distilling down all of these other guidances that are out there, right? So we have different layers of government providing guidance and recommendations. Our role is to use all of that data that was shared, be able to identify what that means for our community, add that local context, and then have those recommendations going out to our, our community and our partners. So the two large areas that we're looking at for return to school learning is CDC guidance. Um, one thing to note, we have to always think of the scope. The CDC is making recommendations based on what is best for the entire nation. So they have to make recommendations based on what state is doing the worst to what state is doing the best and balancing that. Um, and then we have our, our state health department, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the guidance that they are giving out. Usually that is following very closely to CDC. Again, they are providing for the whole state. They have to think of the, the worst census tract to the best and provide that guidance that is going to be successful for the state as a whole. We are then taking that and blending that together for what does that mean for Berrien County? What do our local numbers look like? What is going to be successful for our residents and our partners? So I'm going to skip this since we came to it earlier. So when we look at that, though, so this new CDC tracking graph um, and these indicators, what we currently have in our county, if we look at our cumulative cases per 100,000, we're at 36.4. And then our seven-day percent positivity is 5.8. Um, it's really easy to look at this at a snapshot in time. What I will caution us on a day-to-day -day basis, one day at a time is enough to look at, right? We have to be looking at the trends. Sometimes what we don't see in the one day, is there could be an outbreak that maybe is not related to community transmission. We want to be able to add context to that. So what we are looking at in the health department is the trend. When we're making recommendations on this, it's not just, Tuesday, this is what happened. Let's do all of the things to this. We're really looking at what has been happening over the last couple of weeks. Where have we been seeing increases? What does this mean for our future numbers? So when we are looking at our seven day cumulative case rate, we have over the last about 14 days been seeing a kind of slow increase in that moderate area. We do wanna to continue to watch that. We don't wanna to get to substantial. If we do keep this trend, there is a bit of a prediction, I think, in the next 7 to 14 days, we could see substantial transmission as our number here. Again, that other data matters, what's happening, happening in our hospitalizations. But looking at this trend matters. We're really working at how do we distill this out for our education partners. Um, one thing to know, and we'll continue to have this communication, the CDC does have a data tracker that identifies every county and where they are. That does change day to day. So one of our challenges or opportunities, if you will, is going to be um, identifying some best practices of how to then be able to add this context to that day-to-day -day number because the trend really does matter. So all of that together is what has culminated in our return to learn guidance for schools. So again, not wearing that regulatory hat in this setting, but being able to be that supportive partner. Our role with the schools is providing guidance, um, recommendations, and technical assistance. Um, this is something that public health does year after year. When we have high flu numbers, if there's a chicken pox case in the school, or God forbid we see measles um, in our area, this is our role. We come into the school, we, we work with our school partners, identify maybe who should be excluded for a time because that is what is best for their health, for the school's health, and make sure that we can do that on an individual basis. One thing that I think we've heard, and, and we know this too, um, is there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, and that's where being able to provide guidance and recommendations and additional context to those is really important. We have health departments and communities across the state that have different capabilities. We have that same thing with our schools. Some are able to better space out, others are not. So the different layers of prevention strategies that they can put on might look different school to school. And that really is something we want to support our school leaders in, in preparing for their student bodies. 
So the, the things that this plan contains um, really are the layers of prevention strategies. And we know these work. We have worked over the last year and a half with our school leaders. We meet with them weekly. We provide data updates on a weekly basis, really understanding. We, we know that these layers are successful. What we have provided in this guidance this year are just some, some recommendations of how they might be layered depending on what we're seeing in community transmission. Um, so again, each school might be able to do this different. They all have different means and abilities to, to layer those pieces on. If our transmission increases, it is turning the dial up or back, right? You're layering on more of those, maybe increasing your social distancing with students, adding in some cohorting, Masking is a key piece of that. We do know that that can be a protective layer. But again, working with our schools to layer those on as, as they're able, as is feasible for them, and is making sense with our community transmission. So this is something that is on our website. Um, one of the pieces of this in supporting our schools is really being able to, to communicate this out with our public, with our parents. Um, we know that the last year and a half has been incredibly stressful um, for our community. We know that there are more emotions and we're 18 months past where we had patients before, but trying to build a roadmap, trying to build what to expect for our families. And the reality is if our transmission increases, we really do want our schools to add more layers of prevention. It is really important to protect our general community and population. And so being able to work with them to do that um, and again, though, adding all these different data. So yes, these are all across these low, moderate, substantial, and high categories, um, and those two indicators. But when we give those recommendations, we're really wrapping around it with all of those other aspects that we're looking at. Okay, I think I have two slides left. Um, so what do we know at this time? I just wanted to kind of tie us into what we really know is true in, in our community, in our response to COVID-19, um, and what we've continued to learn. Um, we really do know that vaccinated individuals are less likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID-19. That is a win. I know we've heard about breakthrough cases. M majority of those breakthrough cases have been either mild to no symptoms, that is truly a success, right? We're not having hospitalizations. We're not seeing that severe illness. We still unfortunately know that unvaccinated Americans are still vulnerable to severe illness and hospitalization. By and large, where we're seeing our high transmission areas, where we're seeing our hospitalizations in increased, that is in our areas of, of low vaccination. It is still rare for children under 12 to experience serious forms of COVID-19. This is an area that is still under study, so there may be different things that come out of that, but this is what we know at this time. Um, and right now, the variants that we know of, and I, I want to say the variants that we know of because that is still something that from a public health lens, we're always looking at what, what else could, could shift in our narrative, is it doesn't change these facts. The Delta variant is more transmissible, and that is that is worrisome. So our original that our original variant, the guess original COVID-19, you were transmitting maybe to one to three people. You've heard the term R not one to three people. With Delta, you are more in that five to eight. So you have seen that increased transmission that lines up a little bit more um, with chicken pox. So it is a higher transmissible thing. We are not seeing that it causes more severe illness. However, if you have more people who you can transmit to, you do have a higher, higher likelihood of people having that severe illness. These are all things that we're going to think about. Also, we've learned a lot. We know the prevention and mitigation strategies that work. We are going to continue to communicate to our community. And prevention in the form of COVID-19 is still our greatest fight against COVID-19. That is really where we're going to be able to continue to see our numbers remain low. Just to summarize, um, what we really are looking at at the health department, these are the five categories that we are going to monitor. This is what drives our decision, not one or two different pieces, but all of these together. We're looking at our community transmission and spread. 
So this includes our, our indicators and thresholds. You saw those different levels of that. We're looking at our health system capacity. We're ensuring that we are not overwhelming the system, that if you need preventative care, if you need those other care pieces that you are there. Um, we're looking at our vaccine coverage. We need to see that continuing to increase. Um, we're really hopeful this fall that the vaccine will be approved for um, two to 11 year olds or five to 11 year olds maybe. Um, and we are also really hopeful that this fall we're actually going to see full FDA approval for Pfizer, potentially Moderna shortly after that. That will really be a, um, I think, a layer of added confidence for those who might still be in that hesitant area. Um, early detection, this is where it's still really important as our cases remain low, cutting the line of transmission. So case investigation, being able to use those isolation and quarantine um, powers to really ensure that we are not having increased transmission. When we're able to do that, when we're having eight cases a day, it means we're really able to add that really high level of protection around our community and, and cut that down. And then our populations at risk. Right now, our vulnerable populations, our most vulnerable in the county, have that really high vaccination rate. As we continue to watch for variants, look forward, that's what we don't want to see shift. We don't want to see a new population become vulnerable to the virus. That would change our current narrative. So we're continuing to watch that as well. So I guess bottom line, we are in Berrien County. We are in a good place right now. We want to stay there. We are seeing a little bit of that increase of cumulative cases. So we will continue to watch that. We're going to put out some of those, those reminders to wash hands, keep some of that distancing when you can. But we, we are in a good place in Berrien County. Unfortunately, the pandemic is not over yet. We, we still want to watch these pieces and help us get from pandemic to endemic. We're not going to lose COVID, but we will get to a point where it is a little bit more business as usual, if you will, for the health department. We're just not there yet. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, any questions from around the horseshoe? Um, I've got a couple of questions and I like, actually, I've got a lot of questions and I'll email you most okay. of them. Um, <laughs> most importantly, we, Mac mentioned earlier, we don't um, run or control the schools. However, um, in these recommendations, are anything in here mandated by the state or federal government? At this time, the only thing that is mandated in there um, well, there, I guess it depends on how we look at mandates, is the CDC does have an order for masking while you're on public transportation, which does extend to the school bus. Um, at the state level, there are currently no mandates for schools. It is all guidance and recommendations from the state level as well. Everything else out of the CDC um, is there. When we talk about things of keeping sick staff or kids home, there are statutory rules for both public health and schools to not let um, sick kids in school. So for any reason, not correct. just COVID. Correct. Um, and then um, my second question was, are the, some of these recommendations seems counter to some of your presentation. Okay. So how does that measure out? Like are the percentage of positive of the, the uh, under 19, of course you have zero in deaths, um, in and yet we're recommending um, different things at different levels um, for that population. Do we make these resume recommendations based on the age of the population that you're recommending them to, or is this just a general recommendation for all age groups, even though there aren't really 85-year-olds in school? Sure. Um, so when we do make public health recommendations, we can't just think about it as in one age group because we know that we have we have blended families, families interact, we have a community that is impacted across those age groups. So that is one of the thoughts in putting this together and that matters to our community context. Um, one of the things that I think you will know in there that our plan does pretty much align with what our recommendations would be across any age group. So if we are in that low to moderate, it is a public health recommendation if you're unvaccinated and you are in an indoor crowded space to wear a face covering. So that is in a line. We, we have not altered our school plan because that is what we would recommend across our whole community for overall community health. Okay. Um, 
Courtney, I just got a couple of things. If you would look into these for me and to sure. see if you can get back to me. Um, it's been reported that 74 to 77 per percent of the people who are affected by the uh, Delta variant are people who have already been vaccinated. Um, I want to find out if that is if that is a correct uh, percentage. And I would also like to find out um, for the United States or for Michigan, what is the percentage of the people that are getting the Delta variant that were unvaccinated? And also, what is the percentage of the people and age groups of uh, the Delta variant um, that are not getting any of this because they have natural immunity because they've had the COVID or if they are getting the Delta variant and they've already had the natural immunity. If you could look into those numbers and see what you can come up with on that, I would appreciate that because I think that has a lot to do with what we're discussing uh, right here. And I and I ask that you do it if possible by age groups so we could actually see um, see these particular numbers. That's all I want. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will work on those. Some of them, I'm going to be honest, Delta, not everybody who tests positive for COVID-19 is been tested for Delta. So there are going to be some limitations in there, but I can definitely see what we can we can provide. Um, yep. One, one other thing, um, what tests are we using for the Delta? If they're now saying that the PCRs uh, are not being used, what are we using? We're we using serum tests or? So the PCR is still the standard test that you would do at like a doctor's office or a pharmacy. What's happening is then from that positive test, so many are having that, that heightened like genotyping and that happens at the state lab or other labs. That's not going to happen right now at your, your local doctor's office. Right. Thank you. Not here. He's trying to corral everything. For no, Thank you. I appreciate that. And I will, I, I will send you an email uh, kind of explaining that, but I just have one other question, so thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, just a quick question. It, it relates to Courtney's presentation, but it's not about schools. So the question that I've asked Courtney a couple of times, it relates to county operations. Um, Rocky is in the back. I was hoping to have the, the board just have a quick conversation about states of emergency. Um, I've asked Courtney, and I think she'll confirm that we're not at a point where that's a discussion topic for the board, uh, return to the state of emergency, a return to mass mandates for, for county workers. I was hoping we could just briefly discuss that just so there's clarity amongst the board, as well as give or take about 800 workers that, that work for Marion County. Is that something that we can address quickly can you confirm what you just said? I, I would confirm that. I think it's a worthwhile thing for us to have that discussion and be planning forward. Um, I'd rather plan forward and not need it. At this time, I wouldn't say we're we're there. Okay. It, it, as a follow-up to that, um, for the better part of a year, the Board of Commissioners have signed the Continuing COVID Committee or an extension of the Emergency Operations Committee to this group. I think we're at a point where it probably makes sense to resume that activity at least a couple of times a month so that the elected officials have direct contact with Courtney and with Rocky. If you would like, we could do it as, as we've been doing in the past, just as Zoom, if you would like um, having it in this room as a, just a regular occurrence of committee of the whole. Either can work. It is up to the chair of the board how you want to proceed. Uh, we will, starting next Wednesday at 11 a.m., if that's good, you, know, you have local units you meet with uh, weekly for me. So please check your calendar and make sure that every other Wednesday at 11 a.m. is clear. It'll be the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Rocky, good. So we'll resume the COVID briefing second and fourth Wednesdays of each month. Everybody who is doing it before is doing it again. So that will be 
John, Bob, Jim, Amy, Ezra, Dave, me. Um, and then whoever from the department wants to be in along with Rocky, Sheriff, under Sheriff, Courtney, Jillian, I imagine. And we'll do it on Zoom um, to save fossil fuels. Um, and allow us to have a little more schedule flexibility. But if that looks like that's a problem, second, fourth, Wednesday, we can change it to first and third or just. Um, so every other, but I think it might be easier to calendar second and fourth every month if there are some months where there's going to be five Wednesdays and some not. There's always going to be four Wednesdays. So, uh, and I don't need to cut anybody off. Julie, I, if you had other questions, just give a report to me after. That's the same thing. Uh, anybody else who had questions, let's do a little later because we're already half an hour past up into the agenda. Okay, we're adjourned until 10.30. <laughs>